uzafilaprib, a PARP inhibitor in BRCA positive patients. This was approved based off Olympia study, and here we have an update on this study. Laura, can you touch on its initial study design and the recent updates? Yes, absolutely. So um, the Olympia trial was a phase three double blind randomized trial that enrolled almost 2,000 patients um, who had either hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, or triple negative breast cancer, as well as a BRCA1 or BRCA2 pathogenic mutation. Um, they also had to have high risk clinical features as shown here. Um, if, if they were in the neoadjuvant group for triple negative, they could have a non-PCR. Um, if they were in the ER positive um, or PR positive HER2 negative group, um, they had to meet this um, criteria um, with CPS plus EG. Honestly, I look it up every single time. It's hard to remember the, the specific um, criteria there off the top of your head, but just remembering non-PCR and meeting this high risk criteria that then you can um, look up the specifics of. Um, if patients were treated in the adjuvant setting, if they were triple negative, um, they had to be PT2 or PN1. Um, and if they were ER or PR positive, they had to have four or more positive lymph nodes. So basically, you know, high risk patients in either of these groups um, were randomized one to one um, to receive either a of 300 milligrams twice daily for one year um, versus placebo twice daily for one year um, with the primary endpoint of invasive disease free survival. And um, this is the updated survival analysis at six years. Um, and what we saw is that first looking at the IDFS, um, there was a 9.4% difference at six year IDFS, which is incredibly impressive. And you know, um, any drug that's receiving almost a 10% difference in IDFS is, is definitely um, absolutely worth giving to our patients. Um, so really important, um, you know, new advance for our patients to continue um, giving this drug in the adjuvant setting for those that meet criteria. And then we also saw an overall survival benefit. So this is the updated data at six years of 4.4% difference in overall survival, which is actually even more than, you know, we'd previously seen the data for four years at 3.2, and the curves have only continued to separate with longer follow-up. So now a 4.4% difference at six years. Um, so I think this is really a practice affirming data. You know, we were already using Olaparib in this setting and I think just even further emphasizes, you know, how efficacious this drug is for our patients with a BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. Um, I think, you know, several things that come up with this, I think number one, in the triple negative setting, you know, how do we, you know, how should we combine this with Pembro? Should we do CAPE instead? You know, there's lots of different questions. I think my practice is, um, is, you know, with the Keynote 522 trial, um, there was the adjuvant pembrolizumab given, and we know there's safety data with pembrolizumab plus olaparib. And so even though neither study was studied exactly like that, my practice is if I give a patient the Keynote 522 regimen, they do not have a PCR, but they do have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, I'll do pembro plus olaparib in that patient group um, and not give the capecitabine. If a patient doesn't have a pathogenic BRCA1 or 2 mutation, then I combine capecitabine plus pembrolizumab. And so you'll kind of have those two different options. And I would preferentially use olaparib for patients with BRCA1 or 2 mutations, given this you know, impressive benefit in IDFS and the overall survival benefit. I think the data is much stronger than the use of capecitabine. So we certainly preferentially use olaparib in combination with pembro for these patients. And then I think for our hormone receptor positive patients that meet criteria, um, you know, we have the option of CDK4-6 inhibitors as well, right? So ribocyclib or abemocyclib, neither of which has yet demonstrated an overall survival benefit, whereas we do have an overall survival benefit here with olaparib. And so in that setting, I actually also preferentially use um, olaparib in combination with endocrine therapy. And I would give one year of olaparib combined with endocrine therapy and then in the very highest risk patients, you know, I want to do everything I can to reduce their risk of recurrence. I'll sometimes even follow that with, you know, two years of abema or three years of ribo after you're done with the adjuvant olaparib. I wouldn't combine them, but you can kind of sequentially give um, one after the other. Again, not studied exactly like that in any particular study, but just trying to do everything we can for our highest risk patients um, to reduce their risk of recurrence.
Thanks for covering that, Laura. And that's extremely important. That's what our practice has been, at least from community standpoint, combining that is with pembrolizumab and triple negative breast cancer setting with elaparib. Just to reiterate the importance of the timeline here from Createx standpoint, capecitabine is there for six months time. Pembrolizumab from the start of like or initiation of therapy, total of one year time. Elaparib is one year time when moving into the hormone receptors positive space. We have abemacyclib for two years, while ribo is for three years. Yeah, and exactly. I think right, yep. um, keeping the dose, keeping this timeline, because this is all shifting and all these new approvals, we have to keep all this in mind. And again, as Olympia continues to show overall survival benefit, I think the other important part is making sure we offer germline testing for these patients so that they're exposed to these PARP inhibitors. And importantly, these patients and their families get genetic counseling. I think that is very important.